I'm Jason Louv, and this is the Ultra Culture Podcast. So my guest today is Satoros Phil Brucato, the developer of the classic White Wolf role-playing game Mage the Ascension. Mage was probably the most metaphysically sophisticated game ever created, and beyond being just a game, was a massive hypertext linking genre literature, philosophy, world mythology, and the occult, opening up a world of much greater sophistication to smart 1990s teenagers and college students, much like Vertigo Comics did. If you've never heard of Mage, you've still probably felt its presence, as it was a major inspiration behind the Matrix movies and a lot of late 90s pop culture in general. Mage was a kind of parody of 1990s culture, in which the various pagan and counterculture groups became playable uh, characters. These various groups were banded together by their hatred of the technocracy, a new world order trying to stamp magic from the world and regiment everything. These and various other factions fought for control of reality, using magic, technology, or any other means at their disposal. Obviously, this had a big effect on me. Phil is a pagan in real life, so it's little wonder that his views on magic and politics found their way into the game. He's also a freelance fantasy writer, and has blogged at Daily Costs and uh, Posteros. Recently, he was tapped by Onyx Path, the successor to White Wolf's games division, to reboot Mage for a kickstarted 20th anniversary edition, which is out now. I was super happy to find out that Phil is a fan of Ultra Culture, and so we sat down to have a great Skype conversation on the nature of magic and how to shape our reality. If you enjoy this show, please go to my online school for chaos magic, www.magic.me, that's www.magic.me, and check out the free ebook and eight day email course on magic that I have available there. It's packed with informative reading, instructional videos, guided meditations, and lots more, all on how to use magic to shape your life. Exactly what Phil and I discuss here. Okay, on with the show. So, I'm talking to Satoros Phil Brucato, the legendary role-playing game developer of Mage of the Ascension, and now Mage of the Ascension 20th edition, uh, or pardon 20th anniversary edition um m20 <laughs> m20 as it's called thank you and um I'm, I'm very happy to be talking to somebody who's had such a formative influence on not just my life and view of the world but also that of my friends and lots and lots of people that i know mage was a kind of was and is a kind of a well, it was a combination of, I guess, cyberpunk and urban fantasy and tropes from almost every, like, awesome type of genre literature, and as well as a lot of actual occult working magical uh, philosophy and and practice that was kind of snuck under the radar um, only a few years after the end of the Satanic Panic when people were saying Dungeons and Dragons was going to get people into dodgy occult activities here came along uh, a book, Mage, that not only actually showed you how to do magic, mm -hmm. but put it in the con you know the positive context of saying this might actually save the world. Um, so, Phil, thank you very much for being on the show. Sure, thank you, Jason. And yeah, to, to, to clarify, the the magical elements of Mage, and this was something I always I always pointed out to the, the folks who were working with me on it. Um, the magical elements are, of Mage are not like. Here's a ceremony. Here's the ritual that you use to cast such and such, which is the, the accusation that people made back in the Satanic Panic days, um, that you know that role playing games contain actual spells. Oh, that's horseshit. Okay, no, they don't. <laughs> Anybody who's actually read one of those books knows that, knows that they don't. Unless you're looking at Nephilim, but that's another thing entirely. Well, I will point um, out that I mm -hmm. very very clearly remember reading when I must have been. I, I think somebody handed me a copy of Mage First Edition. <laughs> when I was in seventh grade, and this completely changed the course of my life. But I very distinctly remember reading a copy of the Book of Madness in when I maybe a few years later, I got a copy <laughs> of the Book of Madness. And there's a footnote in that book in the bibliography, uh, or it's all the all the kind of fantasy sources are listed. And I very distinctly remember there's one section that says, we distinctly have not listed any actual occult books, because that wouldn't be very responsible of us, would it? Which was just a, <laughs> for me, was a, yeah. oh, really? What, what am I not being told? And, and, and uh, it was an, inv an open invitation to uh, a reverse psychology to actually go find that stuff, as, as I did by just migrating to a different section of the bookstore. 
<laughs> one of one of the other things that both mage and where uh, the, the rather the white wolf stuff in general is infamous for is our snarky attitude. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was. Uh, oh well, it, that's that's a that's a tangent. But the the important thing with the the magic and the elements of metaphysics that we've been putting into mage is not um, how to cast X and X spell because. As anyone who's familiar with mage knows, mage isn't about the practice of magic. The, the, the important thing about mage, the core theme in it, is you can change the world. If you believe, if you are willing to, if you're willing to do the work, if you believe strongly enough and you're willing to do the work and you're willing to accept the consequences of your actions... Be mindful of what you do, because the things that you do affect the world, and the world affects you in return. Um, that's part of part of what I brought to the line when I started working on it. Uh, I was not uh, one of the authors of the original Mage First Edition. I was hired after that edition was finished, uh, and but I was in charge of the line for the next five years and uh, five years and change and the, the three years since uh, since I started working on Mage 20. Uh, and what, I, what I, I brought to that, among other things, was the idea that if you change the world, you have to be careful about what you do and how you do it. Because everybody changes the world to a degree. Everyone has an effect on the world around them. The more you believe, the more you do, the more you uh, you change. But that changes you in return. Uh, one of the things that always bothered me uh, about uh, magic and role playing games prior to Mage was people just like fireball, fireball, yes. fireball, you know, and just burn this, blow this up, you know, change this, take the, you know, cast this enchantment spell over this person. There was never any kind of consequences other than the physical damage you inflicted on your enemies. I'm like that's not the way magic works. Right. Right. So I'm, I'm interested, um, you know, certainly there were not actual, obviously not actual how to do magic tech parts of Mage, but it was clearly, it was always clear to me reading it um, that it was, it was written by people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like it was, and, and certainly it was written by people who were um, interested in, you know, paganism or the occult subculture and who had, uh, you know, who had in, at least an interest in it. And I, I've always been curious, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this show with you is to, to understand the actual, what the influences that actually went into Mage, what was the real magic that actually went into Mage, To if you pardon the oversimplification. Sure. Well, and, and not, <clears throat> not, just, uh, not just paganism and the occult. I mean, Kathleen Ryan, uh, Marauder Girl, um, and uh, James Estes looking eagle or Christian, and they brought that into uh, they brought that into mage as well. Okay. Um, we had I'm trying to remember. <clears throat> excuse me. I know we had some Buddhist people working on it, but I don't remember who they were off the top of my head. Um, uh, Lucien Soban was uh, was Muslim. Um, Sam and Abinet was uh, was Sufi, mm. uh, and kind of a very <laughs> strange Sufi even by Sufi by Sufism standards. Wow. But uh but yeah, I mean he was that Islam is is his was his chosen path at least at that time. Uh and so it was bigger than just um neo paganism. So really just a game about belief and how it shapes the world. Exactly. Uh and that and that was the, the fundamental thing for Mage, um from from my standpoint anyway, is that it's a game about it's a game about believing, um, and I've always and this is a, a, a I, I generally try to avoid bashing on the revised days, but it was something that had bothered me about the uh, the revised edition of Mage was someone who was outside of the Mage group um, who was in sales and marketing said, "Oh, we should make it about how you lost." Mage has always been about hope. Okay. Um, Mage has always where where vampires said you know you're damned rage against the you know rage against the beast within um, how werewolf said you know go out fighting the the cosmic evil how wraith said you're dead and uh, you're dead and you missed out on life and changeling said you know um, the the magic is going away you have you're, you're losing the magic remember the magic in you mage said fuck you change the world yes. Yes. Join the battle for reality, as Kathleen Ryan put it on yes. uh, 
on the poster for Mage Second Edition. One of the things we were just talking about uh, earlier was that um, how much I mean, basically, you know, Mage kind of just took all of the different factions in the real world, trying to change the world and turn them into character classes, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's very, you know, it's hard for me now, or rather easy for me now to look at, for instance, Twitter, and see, you know, <laughs> look at things like, oh, well, now we have transhumanists, and we have, mm -hmm. you know, radical people from various edges of the uh, various ends of the spectrum or the, the new age revival and things like this. And it's hard for me not to see that as character classes or kind of mage mm -hmm. factions. And, um, you know, Twitter to me seems like a nonstop battle, like a, a, mm -hmm. a wizard battle of nonstop uh, people hurling ideologies at each other or, you know, a Magic the Gathering game almost of people mm -hmm. trying to trump each other with their their beliefs. Yeah, this is, and we we talked about this a little bit in a uh, portion that maybe we can revisit in the podcast and just part of a conversation Jason and I were having, but um, the idea how Mage is more relevant to the 21st century than it was to the 90s. Yes. Uh, the original 90s version, when, when Mage first came out in 1993, it was, as, as, as he referred to it, you know, trench coats and katanas. That was a running joke uh, mm -hmm. that the internet... The World Wide Web went online less than two years before Mage came out. Um, that uh, we had that, that whole X Files vibe. This is years before even Buffy, much less before social media, um, before I mean, think it was before laptop computers even existed. Or if they did, at that point, they were still very big, bulky, and expensive. Although trinary uh, computers don't still don't fully trinary. exist. Although I noticed the NSA is working on it, but there's mm -hmm. it's still going to take them another 30 years, I think. I was amused when I read up on quantum computing and said, oh, trinary computers. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I always loved that one. That was, uh, I give, give the shout out to Darren McKeeman for that one because he was, he was a, a, an actual hacker who was working on, uh, on Mage in the early days. And uh, he introduced me to a lot of the ideas of, of uh, the hacking community and the possibilities of information technology. I personally suck with, with technology, um, but I knew that, uh, that Mage, even in the 90s, had to, had to address it and not just as an evil opposition to magic because you know, on a lot of levels... Magic is, or rather, techno Well, magic is a technology. I go into that in in more detail in Mage Twenty. And technology does magical things. One of the things the twenty first century has proven is that when you hand people, when you give people um, the technological tools, what we will do with it is magical. And that was a major change from from the original emphasis of Mage First Edition, which was the technology was bad and technology was evil. And we have these virtual adepts over here, but they're kind of sketchy. <laughs> um, but but technocracy, you know, will destroy you and all of this. And I was like, you know, I Brian Campbell and I started dismantling that idea way back in, in, in when we first started working on Mage in in '93. Uh, completely threw a brick through the window with, with my introduction to uh, the, the guide to the technocracy in 98 with the, yes, thank you, th you're, you're welcome. You know, you, we created all of these things for you. You can do this and you can do this. You can do, you're welcome. We uh -huh. did it. Uh -huh. um, which I, I'm, I'm told rearranged a lot of people's, uh, rearranged a lot of people's brains at the time. <laughs> um, but in the 21st century, We've seen that the idea that techno that technology dehumanizes people is is absolutely incorrect. It's the other way around. Um, technology used um, used with with a sense of wonder and with a sense of responsibility opens doors and opens eyes and opens minds in ways that were not possible before. Yes. Although there are certainly dehumanizing parts of it. Mm -hmm. Plenty of dehumanizing shit about living in the forest, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. one, one of the other big differences between the Mage of the 90s and, and uh, Mage 21st, or you know, Mage in the 21st century, is the amount of life experience that I personally had in between working on them. Okay. Uh, you know, when I, when I started on Mage in the 90s, I was in my, my mid-20s, uh, you know, mid-20s suburban kid, uh, had been... You know, had had been involved in uh, in paganism since my teens, and had been involved and interested in religion and and uh, philosophy and history since I was a kid. Um, but my life experience was still pretty limited. Okay. Um, 
in the years in between 1999 when I left Mage and uh, 2013, or rather uh, 2011 when I began working on Mage 20, uh, I lived a lot. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm a voracious reader, hmm. uh, but I just did a lot of things, saw a lot of things, met a lot of people um, that that I hadn't had the opportunity for. The more, the larger my world became, the larger Mage's world became. Wow. So let me ask you this. What what was your definition of magic when you began Mage, and what is it now? That is a really good question. Hmm. Um, I think in both cases, when I first started working on Mage, we should probably, for those who haven't, who, who for those who are listening to the podcast and who <laughs> weren't flies on the wall for our earlier conversation, uh, we had talked about how I got involved with Mage. We should revisit that yes. shortly, yes. but. Um, but when I first started working on Mage, uh, I re- my my primary view of magic was magic was something that allowed you to tap into something outside yourself. Um, as I worked on Mage, I realized that magic is something that comes from within you and allows you to have a greater effect on the world around you. Um, now at 51, after having done mage in some form or another for, for almost 10 years and having on a lot of levels kind of lived mage, <laughs> whether I was doing mage or not, um, I realized that magic is a conscious, a, the, the conscious intent, action and ability to change the world around you as you, as, as you will that change, um, in your ability to, to change to change the world and to affect the world, I believe. Well, I don't just believe. I mean, I've seen it uh, and I've lived it. That the more conscious you are about the way that you choose to move through the world, the more you will affect the world as you move through it. What's a, what's a good example or a story you can relate that that demonstrates that? So, one of the things that laid the groundwork for me returning to Mage was. Um, Shortly after I got on Facebook in, this would be 2010, 2000, I guess 2000, 2008 is when I got onto Facebook. So in 2009 or so, um, a, a now a very, very dear friend um, uh, named uh, Anthony, Anthony Galatis, um, he had gotten in touch with me and he said, oh my God, I love Mage. I, you know, I grew up on Mage. Thank you so much for the effect that you've had on my life. And... Uh, and he lives in Greece, uh, in, in Athens, in Piraeus. And, um, and he, by way of Facebook, and this is, Facebook right there is an example of technology doing magic. Uh, and there's a lot of bad that things that people can do through Facebook, but there's a lot of good too. This is an example of that. So um, through Facebook, he introduced me to his sister Nina, to his best friend Haris, uh, to his, his, uh, his then girlfriend Maria. Uh, to um, Haris's then girlfriend Joanna, and I, within days, my partner Sandy and I uh, had over a dozen friends in Greece. You know, which wow. we'd never been to Greece, and we didn't know anybody in Greece until that. Suddenly, there were all these people, and we're talking to each other and stuff. And and Haris sends me an email. They they all invited us to come to Greece. I'm like, at that point, we're barely making rent. And I'm like, thank you, that would be wonderful. I don't know how we're ever going to do it, but I'd love to meet you guys. So Haris says, um, we would like to fly you out here for Anthony's name day. Would you be interested? And I'm like, are you offering to fly me and my partner out to Greece? And he says, yes. I said, hell yes. <laughs> so fast forward a few months while they got that all together and we got our passports in order. And these people are absolutely amazing. Um, I cannot, there, I have lots and lots of words and I don't have words for what that, that week that we were there is like, um, Anthony, Haris, Joanna, Nina, Maria, um, Bangalis, uh, just a whole bunch of people. It was, there is no word other than magical for, for that week. And I don't mean that as, oh, wow, it was neat to hang out in Greece. I mean, it was deep soul stuff. Hmm. It was the sort of experience you can only know by living it. Um, the connection with, with, with all of them was immediate and very, very soul deep. Um, 
we did some things. Uh, we, we talked a lot. We stayed up, you know, till ridiculous hours. Um, we, we did a ritual consecrating a space. Um, we, we went, we visited the temple of, of po- Poseidon, Poseidon. Hmm. Um, and we bonded in ways that I bond with very, very few people. That very few people, I think, do bond. And one of the things I realized and that they emphasized over and over again is this is what the people we are, the people they are, um, are the people that they are because of what we did with Mage. Wow. Um, and m- much like you said, Jason, this was this was something where they were at a time when they at a time when they were young and they wanted and needed something that that we in in, in White Wolf and particularly the Mage crew uh, inspired the way that they lived their lives. Um, one of the guys. Um, blanking on his name off the top of my head just because I do that. Um, uh, but he was saying that, he says, I wanted to let you know that I read, after I read the Cult of Ecstasy book, I went to India and I studied Hinduism. Hmm. Wow. And I studied Tantra while I was there. Um, and things, like that, that's huge. There Something people, I've also spent a lot of time doing as a, as a knock-on for a mage potentially. <laughs> Not directly, but certainly in terms of getting interested in magic and then ending up in India, studying Tantra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and that, um, when I came back from that, I said, uh, I, I, I contacted all the people, some of whom I was still in good, co- in, in, you know, in good terms with, some of whom I wasn't, uh, but I contacted a bunch of the people from the mage crew, and I said, I just wanted, you, I wanted you all to know we did good. You know, this this stupid little game that we worked on 20 years ago, it, it it literally changed people's lives for the better, and they are amazing human beings as a result. We did good, folks. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm I'm still inspired by Mage in what I do now. You know, certainly in in ultra culture, um, and just my view of the world, and the the idea that the world can be changed not only by magic but simply by will by belief by intention which really is magic you don't have to Mm -hmm. dress it up in 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 stage clothes you know or do technical ritualsness but that can be fun too um Mm -hmm. but you know it is i think we were saying earlier um in our earlier conversation um you know how well i feel mage holds together as a way to view the world as kind of a meta script to uh mm-hmm. view uh um to, you know to view world events and and most important to that much like i think most important to the idea of magic when used correctly is the idea that individuals can change the world and not that the world is controlled by some type of top down religious mm-hmm. structure or political structure um, that where agency is taken away from people, which is of course the case in totalitarian countries or, um, or theocratic countries, you know, which is mm-hmm. very scary, you know, uh, you know, the, the, maybe not the technocracy, but the, the theocracy is a very, uh, frightening force in our world in the many ways. The corpocracy is worse. The corpocracy? Oh, the corp, I, I think the, 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 the major challenge to the 21st century is actually the corpocracy. Okay. Uh, how and and how do you see that? Oh, it's it's the it's the corporate it's it's the quote, quote unquote corporate citizens who are strip mining our strip mining our resources, strip yes. mining our world, strip mining our lives, and continuing to sell us their vision of reality, which is pitting us against each other so that we don't take them down. Right, and that that's one of the big things you, you were asking uh, earlier about. The, the the emphasis the change in, in the dynamics of the struggle of uh, of mage in the 21st century uh, in mage the ascension back in the 90s the, the the primary when when mage first came out the primary conflict was shown to be the technocracy versus the traditions their traditions being um, seven out of ten of the uh, the traditions being uh, the the guardians of old style magic and two of them being uh, being sort of avatars of uh, a new style of magic, uh, 
through technology, and one of them, and one of them, the cult of ecstasy, kind of bridging the uh, bridging the gap and saying, "Hey, technology is interesting, and the old ways are important, and and we can merge these things and and work with all of these things," versus the the theoretically monolithic technocracy, which was revealed over the course of uh, Mage, the the the, uh, the original years of Mage, to be anything but a monolith. Um, that was dedicated to the idea of control uh, uh, over random elements and reality deviance uh, to create a better world, which is what they were going for. They were going for uh, for the idea of a better world where werewolves didn't come tearing through your house and and uh, your water was clean and and there wasn't you know the the wizard on the hill wasn't sacrificing your kids to cast mm-hmm. uh, you know, to to change the weather and so forth. Which still happens in real life in some parts Which of our still world happens in real life yeah, sadly. exactly very sadly yeah. sometimes magic can be sometimes the technocracy can look really good right exactly and that's one of the things uh for for folks who aren't familiar with mage one of the the primary themes that i've been doing with mage since the uh, since the early 90s is the idea that everybody has elements of the truth correct and everybody is correct and everybody is corrupt in certain elements huh. and the minute you begin believing that you're the that you have the one true way is the is the point where you're fucked and you become the enemy and that's as true of the traditions as it is with the technocracy that's um, great that's great it's certainly been my experience and the way that the way that the dy- dynamic has shifted in the 21st century is that the traditions and technocracy and other mages who are called the disparates who basically say fuck you and fuck your ascension war um we're going to take care of our own that those characters are all equally playable and equally valid um you know you're not fighting against the evil whatever you could be you could theoretically even have a group of tradition technology and uh, technocracy and uh, uh and disparate mages working together because the ultimate threat in the 21st century is the corruption of the dark side of the human self. Huh. Okay. Uh, that's embodied most by the Nefandi, but um, as, as Mage 20 makes very clear and the currently in progress book of the Fallen will make even clearer, the Nefandi don't need to be running around going boogie boogie blood magic Satan on you. Um, the Nefandi just need to point you in the right direction and go, hey, that guy over there, he sucks. Hmm. You're better than he is. And people will do your work for you. So, what is the force of corruption as you see it in the in the twenty first century, and what you know, what is it represented by, and where does it come from? I think the ultimate force of of, of uh, outside <laughs> outside of our, our our normal tendency to uh, uh, I guess control our uh, control our population by killing one another. Mm. Uh, I think the ultimate form of, of human corruption is the belief that one is that one is better than others you know to believe that you have the one truth that you are the chosen way or the chosen path or the chosen race the chosen gender you know the way that you are right and those people over there are wrong and so you should dominate them and you should destroy them and you know god wants you to God wants me. God told me to skin you alive. In the, uh, the immortal words of Jello Biafra. Um, <laughs> that was a good impression. <laughs> thank you. I was a huge Dead Kennedys fan in college. Yes. Uh, that doesn't come through in Mage at all. No. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. After Mage Twenty came out, and and I did deliberately put some red flags in there for for MRAs and and racists and okay. so forth to get okay. pissed about. And. I didn't do it for publicity. I did it because I genuinely can't stand those people. And uh, yes, it's very strange that the new the new factions that uh, yeah. the online world has created. Um, and uh, and and certainly, we, it's interesting that you touch on this because after Gamergate, um, when when Gamergate happened, I had this it's still happening. Oh well, yes, now. when it yeah uh, when it was when it was in the headlines. Let's say um, most of all, um, I really had a moment of revulsion of not just of everything of all of the Gamergate stuff, but, you know, certainly looking at my own, you know, fixation on video games, for instance, or my own, not just, not to pick on video games, but disconnection from other people Mm -hmm. and living in the world of technology and keeping other people at arm's length. And I realized this is really bad for me. You know, like the internet mm-hmm. is bad. This is the not. It's not the internet is bad, but the internet can be bad for can people bad. if take if if it breeds social isolation because 
I'm looking at this debate and it's like, these are people who, you know, the re it's the, the level of which people are seeing each other as almost like enemies in a video game mm -hmm. on a screen and not seeing that's a human being is shocking. So my reaction to this was I'm going to get really back into role-playing games. Like I'm mm -hmm. going to stop. Um, cause I, cause I just re remembered all of the, um, good times I had with role-playing mm -hmm. games. And I was just thinking, you know, when's the last time I sat down and had l a long conversation with a group of people. And for me, you know, living in LA can be isolating. And one of the reasons why I like doing this podcast is because it's an excuse and a time frame to sit and have a conversation for a long period of time with somebody, which mm -hmm. um, we don't do so much anymore in our, you know, we're so, you know, checking our phones all the time and role-playing games as well offer that, um, you know, that, uh, it, it offers a context to sit down and have a conversation about ideals, values, and beliefs with people for, in a really deep way for a long period mm -hmm. of time. And so I got really back into, into, um, uh, when Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition came out, I got, I was writing about, I was writing about it for Boing Boing a lot. And I wrote about this, um, and I wrote about this specific issue for Boing Boing about how I really feel. And I really do believe this, that role-playing games really need to come back and i think they are coming back and one of the reasons is because it allows people to socially interact with each other in a really mm -hmm. deep and non-superficial way and that's what i think people need more than anything not just yeah. the role-playing games obviously but but um through whatever medium because people have become so um disconnected from each other you know that's ironically cool. even though they're more connected in in theory in terms of information it's it, it can be it's it is dehumanizing in some ways because it, it, you know, people turn into blips on a screen. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, have you seen the, the German film, The Bader Meinhof Complex? I'm aware of it, but, and I, I you know, was very, um, I did a ton of reading about the Bader Meinhof um, group in college, but I haven't seen the movie. I highly recommend the movie. I'm, I'm recommending this to both Jason and to anybody who's listening to this podcast. It is possibly the most relevant film I've seen in years because mm -hmm. although it, it deals with the uh, the late 60s and early into mid-70s and the, the formation of the Red Army faction, what the theme of the movie is, which is it's very, re it was, it's very relevant to Germany, but it's very relevant to all of us, is what happens when you wind up in an echo chamber. Wow. It's, the, film is, the film is about how a bunch of smart, intelligent, you know, a bunch of smart, intelligent, driven, motivated people with all the right intentions become absolute monsters because they, they lock themselves up in an echo chamber where the only thing that they hear is each other and that they keep trying to top each other with, well, I'm, I'm more ideologically pure than, you're, than you are. Well, we must be more ideologically pure, and you're not willing to be as ideologically pure as I am. And next thing you know, you that, well, they're, they're killing people, they're blowing up buildings, they're even shooting each other because the only voice they hear in their heads is each, is, is, is each other and is themselves, and it's amplified to the point of madness. Wow. Doesn't that describe the Internet? exactly crazy yeah that when the it's crazy how as i'm sure you're familiar with robert anton wilson's concept of the reality oh, tunnel yeah. you know mm -hmm. how how much the internet allows you to only see what you want to see ironically mm -hmm. even though it's supposed to give you all this information it's like you know when you're reading a newspaper or you're watching tv you're bombarded with information that you don't necessarily want now or you were at one point um now it's uh, there's so much out there it's easy to live in a completely self-constructed reality tunnel and i'm the same i mean I've, cr I've constructed this reality tunnel for myself where i'm surrounded only with you know uh occult type ideas you know and um whether that's you know and that's that's probably not healthy but um yes it it does exactly what you're saying it allows people to live in echo chambers and i certainly see with online debate for instance Mm -hmm. how easy it is to just hit the block button and just mm -hmm. oh, blip edit that person out of my reality never have to deal with them again instead exactly. of thinking about you know maybe they actually are pointing out you know, maybe i actually am saying something wrong maybe i am crossing a boundary maybe i am articulating myself in a way that is hurtful to another group of people and instead of doing the self-analysis of like oh maybe okay the, instead of having the reality check of like maybe i'm out of line here you can just block somebody and then that, that, you know, you no longer have that friction in your echo chamber. 
Mm -hmm. And and if you want to to bolster an argument, there is a website or a YouTube video for every possible whack job idea, strange conspiracy theory, or outright lie you could possibly imagine. Yes, yes. And you know somebody can go, well, I got this off this website. Well, that website is you know is, is you know posted by this person. Well, th my my source over here says that you you can't trust that person. And it is a battle. It is battling ideologies, and which is again very, very mage. Yes, um, absolutely. One of, the, uh, one of the I don't remember if I mentioned it in this podcast or during our early uh, our early conversation, but one of my uh, my primary inspirations on mage uh, has always been Rashomon. Okay. In which Japan, uh, which is, it was it was uh, the film was done. I'm not sure about the play. It was based on a play, but the film was done in the aftermath, immediate aftermath of World War II. During the buildup for World War II, the Japanese people um, had essentially they had an isolationist culture to begin with, <clears throat> but essentially there was a government controlled <clears throat> militaristic mindset that said, you know a good Japanese person does this and you will do this and you will do this and our enemies are this or this and this and this and this and they had very little uh, um, very little uh, experience outside of that because the, the society was not only geographically isolated but so rigidly controlled uh, at that time building up to the war that they absolutely felt as we did yeah, and still do in a lot of uh, in a lot of ways when dealing with uh, the Middle East uh, here in America, um, that those people over there are monsters, and so therefore anything you do to a monster is good. Um, there's a, a hellish, I mean, so to speak, a hellish amount of that right now. Yes, there is. Shockingly, I mean, if you look at, the, for instance, the, uh, I mean, I think the the immigration crisis in Europe is a, mm. a classic. You know, is such a stress test of of all of this. You know, and it's. No, and it, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it's it's uh, shocking to me. For instance, reading books about propaganda that was deployed in World War One or World War Two, and seeing the same stuff repeating it's today. Like, for thing. instance, you know, all you have to do is accuse one group of people of murdering babies, and then that's an immediate pretext for war. How many times has that been used? And people continue mm -hmm. to fall for it over mm -hmm. and over again. Um, yeah, and that's one of one of the key. I one of the other key themes in Mage has always been going back to to Rashomon. It's always been that there are many different ways to view reality. Yours is not the only perspective. Yours is not the only truth. The minute you start thinking that you have the truth is the minute that you've lost. I think that's and, that's incredibly well put. Thank you. No, I um, mean, uh, uh, and I think that this is so crucial right now more than at any other time. And it, for you know, I was very inspired by Robert Anton Wilson and Timothy Leary and the idea of the reality tunnel is so important now. And I, one of the reasons I know I really like the, I, um, you know, I work to popularize the idea of magic online, but I think that more than any, more than the kind of bell book and candle, uh, or ceremonial or dress up approach to it. It's just the idea that reality is mutable and reality changes based on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. And therefore it behooves you to, look at it in as many ways as possible and take on as many beliefs and identities as you can. And, you know, certainly Timothy Leary used to say, uh, you've got to continually increase the information you're getting, but not just information, but information from different sources, number, you know, increase the number of sources, read information from parts of the political spectrum or ideological spectrum that you don't agree with and try mm -hmm. to understand where they're coming from. And the internet is the at once the best ever tool for doing that, for expanding your frame of reference. And also what you were just saying is the best tool ever for getting into your own echo chamber where you're living in your own pocket reality. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One of the things that was very helpful in between my, my tenure on Mage in the 90s and my tenure on Mage now is that in between there, and this was an ego check. <laughs> After I left White Wolf, I ended up working in bookstores for seven and a half years, um, you know, doing retail while I was trying to keep my, trying to get my my writing career started up again. Um, and it was at that point writing for uh, witches and pagans and, and uh, uh, New Witch magazine, uh, Realms of Fantasy magazine, a few others. Uh, but 
because I was working in those bookstores, I saw, you know, er literally every day, everything that was being published. And so, especially when I was the periodicals lead uh, in the magazine section at two of the three stores that I worked at, um, I read the magazine, I I, I read American Conservative, you know, and I'd read The Nation and American Conservative, and, you know, and I'd, I'd read National Geographic, and I'd read Spin, and I'd read this and I'd read that and and tried to get as much of a, as broad a perspective as I could. I would read an Ann Coulter book if for no other reason so I'd know what the venomous bitch was saying. <laughs> um, yes. And it's it's a, a thing that I learned <laughs> um, way back when I guess my my first real spiritual experience. I was I was raised <clears throat> nominally Catholic Lutheran. I mean my mom was Lutheran, my dad was Catholic and um We'd go to church. Church meant absolutely nothing to me other than I'm bored on Saturday, uh, on Sunday rather, um, until when they got, uh, when they separated and prepared to divorce, uh, when I was 14, 13, 12, 13, um, I stayed for a week with a, uh, with, with my dad's younger brother who was a born again hippie. Uh, and so I, they, he and his, that he and his wife believe so intensely, um, you know, believe so intensely in, in the born again in born again Christianity that I was very, um, it was what I needed to hear at the time. This is something I want to revisit in a few minutes: the idea of magic and need. Yes, <clears throat> but I was, I was so, I needed something to hang on to. I needed something to believe in. With with my world literally, you know, coming coming apart, um, that. Um, that I was very open to having a spiritual experience, and I did. And I thought for a little while that that experience was I had found the true path. And then I, you know, went to some religious retreats and so forth, and started reading the Bible and praying and stuff. And I was going, "You guys are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> this this is bullshit." <laughs> and it isn't. I I personally, even now today, um, I have a lot of respect and reverence for for the Christ as a Godhead, and yes. I have a lot of respect. For whoever it was that all those myths got built up, built up around, and I believe there was an actual historical person at the the core of all of that shit. But what got worked up around him, mm-hmm. and what was built up from the the war texts of of a of a nomadic desert tribe that yes. massacred everyone in sight, yes. uh, is horrifying. And I said, this is. First of all, your book contradicts itself in a million different ways. Second of all, you're not what you're doing isn't even true to your book. Yes. And, you know, got the, oh, well, you're not, you're just not reading it right. And the fact that I was able to quote, it, it's still, this still is a, a, a fun rhetorical thing. The fact that I'm able to quote chapter and verse of scripture back at people and go, no, well, actually it says this, um, taught me really early on um, how valuable it is to know, to, to know as much information as you can get and to be able to tell people, no, right here it says such and such, or right over here the story is this. And of course, processing that much information from that many different sources, you also realize that everybody, everybody is biased. Right, 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 um, right. And the, the, the Wiccans are no, yes. le- the Dianics are no less biased than Baptists. It always yeah. amazes me how often how right wing uh, the pagan community can be, but that's a whole other that's a whole other tangent we don't have to get into. I, what I really want to get, what I really want to, um, I want to circle back to you had mentioned talking about magic and need. Magic and need, yeah. And I, so I want to talk about um, um, what you mean by that concept, and also the early days of of um, how you became the developer on Mage, and the, for lack of a better way of putting it, the real magic that led to that. Thank you. Uh, well, as uh, as I'd been telling Jason, uh, I guess at this point a few hours ago, um, one of the things I've always stressed to uh, my collaborators, and which I've, I've especially stressed in Mage 20th, but I, I was stressing back in the 90s as well, is magic comes out of need. People don't learn magic or create magic, magical cultures, magical practices don't come out of, oh, I think if I draw this line over here, then I'll get to rebel against my parents. That's bullshit. You know, magic comes, magic and practices, religions, beliefs, cultures evolve because somebody said, oh my God, I need this thing. You know, my life is hell. <laughs> I am, I am desperate. You know, my, I, I can't eat. Uh, my children are dying. Um, 
you know, the, 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 you know the, this, the tigers are eating us, whatever it happens to be, but I need this thing that will help me and my people survive. And it may not necessarily be a matter of strictly survival. It may be I want to make more money. It may be I want to get laid. It may be I want to be seen as a human being. Those are all survival as... needs as well. Exactly. Yeah. And that's magic, the need for magic, faith, technology for that matter. Uh, and I believe on a, lot of, on a lot of levels, those are all the same thing. The separation between them, and this has been a point in, in Mage for ages, has been the, the separation between those things. It's an illusion. Um, that they are essentially the same thing, but that um, they, they're, it's driven by a need and a desire to do something. Therefore, if you are conscious of what your needs and desires are, you can be conscious of the ways to change your world. And that is the metaphysical core and the metaphysical truth in Mage, uh, that you have the power to change your world. Now be careful with it, <laughs> because you will. Ch if you believe you have the power to change your world, you will change your world, and your world will change you. Be careful what you do with that, because whether you want to have an effect or not, you will. Uh, and there are other people who are powerful, and their actions will affect you. And be careful with that, <laughs> yes, because you know some of those people will be your allies, some will be your friends, some will be your enemies. You're all human. You're all in this together. Deal. Hmm. Yeah, I think that rings so true for me. Just I, and certainly, you know, my experience in the magical and pagan community, you know, often can, you know, magical people are so good about throwing up an air of glamour around themselves. But mm -hmm. you know, I, more times than not, you know, the, you know, the, you know, people who get into magic definitely get into it out of a sense of need. They're trying to get out of a bad situation, a situation of abuse that's very, very common, um, mm -hmm. or a situation of, of uh, dire straits in one way or another, or a situation of being, or even if it's being unable to, you know, we can even, you know, think about even going back in history about uh, magical people or scientific people trying to escape the institutionalized abuse of theocracy you know, mm -hmm. being existing in a context where your identity is taken away from you or your ability to think freely or express yourself freely is taken away from you, um, which is, you know, uh, so common in our world and becoming more common in some ways, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, and, the, and the theocracy start that way, too. I mean, when you when you look at uh, when when you when you look at the origins of, of the you know, Judeo Christian Islamic uh, monotheism machine, it comes out of one of the harshest physical environments on earth. And when you look at the people who created and adapted and changed and killed people in the name of et cetera et cetera et cetera those those creeds, what you at the core of that you you get a bunch of people who are trying to survive in a, a physically harsh environment with, uh, um, frankly, asshole neighbors. Uh, yes. <laughs> the, the, the Assyrians, not nice people. You know, if, if they decided to conquer you and you resisted, they'd skin you and put your, put your, uh, um, put your skins all over a pyramid and, mm. and then, you know, talk about how great their king was. <laughs> that, that's the people the Hebrews were dealing with. Wow. Um, maybe six or seven years ago, I saw an exhibition of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. um, that was um, brought through by, I think it was touring the U.S. It was paid for by the government of Israel. Uh, it was touring the U.S. And I was looking at these fragments of remaining fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls framed on the wall. And uh, there was one section that very clearly was almost like a demonic contract with the mm -hmm. God Yahweh and the, the response mm -hmm. of Yahweh, which was essentially... I'll get you out of this, but I'm going to own right. you forever until the end of time. <laughs> in in I'm I'm blanking off the top of my head whether it was Isaiah or Ezekiel, but God literally tells him to eat shit for a year. I must have missed that part. I'll have to go. It's, uh, it's, it's 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 either Isaiah or Ezekiel. It's been a while since I read it, but yeah, it basically says God said, you know, you'll be my prophet, and said, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm not really sure about this, and said, and and yeah, and God lays down, you'll do this, you'll do this, you'll do this, and you and you will eat cakes made of uh, made of animals of of animal dung. And he's like, oh God, please don't make me eat cakes of made of animal dung. He says, okay, fine, you have to eat cakes of made of your own dung for a year. <laughs> 
And the prophet's like, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> okay, I have to eat my own shit, but I, but I can't eat, you know, I, I don't have to eat the shit of animals for you. And this, and this is in the Bible, you know. Right. You, you have people going, oh, the Bible is the good book. Read the fucking thing. No, yes. it's not. The God it, of the Bible is yes. a dick. It sounds much more like a record of a demonic conjuration over history. <laughs> Yeah, when when you get the uh, you get the end of the uh, you, you get the end of the great flood, the first thing that happens, first fucking thing, they're off the ark, and and God says, oh by the way, all you surviving animals, you're gonna hate these people. All you you surviving people, you're gonna hate those animals. And animals, you're gonna kill those people. And people, you're gonna kill those animals. And the blood of all the the, the dread of you will be upon them all. Why? For I I am my name is the Lord. Cool. What a douche. <laughs> Yes, well, you know, if if animal sacrifice and human sacrifice was a was a ranked, you know, if there were leaderboards for it, uh, uh, God, uh, that God uh, Yahweh would be at the top. So, okay, um, so, but I, I also want to circle back to um, the, the, the origins of mage, the origins of mage, and and I've always been interested in because you know clearly because clearly uh, uh, mage was written by people who knew about magic and and had thought about it very deeply not just and 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 not just reading grimoires of magic but creating this incredible context for it from uh world history from and connecting all these dots of world history and culture and the counterculture and the you know 1960s and 70s ideas um and so I had always wondered, you know, where were the people, you know, like who made this basically? Like who were these people? Like, you know, what were they trying to say? And well, so I'm very, I'm very interested in y your own story of how you became involved in it and, you know, what was going on behind the scenes there and what, what, what you guys were trying to say to the world. Well, the, the uh, mage had a very complicated genesis. Uh, so back when, uh, when Mark Reinhagen, Stuart Wick and Steve Wick merged the company's White Wolf magazine, which was Stuart and Steve, which they started in high school, um, and Lion Rampant, uh, Lion Rampant Games, I think it was Lion Rampant Publishing, whatever it was, uh, uh, Lion Rampant, which um, uh, Mark Reinhagen and uh, Jonathan Tweet had begun, and which had done the, the RPG Ars Magica, uh, they met at Gen Con in, I believe it was 1990, uh, and decided to merge their companies, and they merged their companies in, I think it was in 89, and they merged the companies in 1990. In any case, uh, Mark, Steve Stewart, and the various people that they worked with, Rich Thomas, um, Dan Greenberg, uh, Chris McDonough, um, Nicole Landrus, um, were, uh, they, they wanted to do more with gaming than just kill orcs. Mm -hmm. And... All of all of these people are phenomenally intelligent people, and you know, are hyper creative misfits, as I, as I phrased it back uh, when I was at White Wolf. A phrase that didn't go over particularly well. Um, and when they decided uh, to do five games, one released every year, it would be based on um, supernatural archetypes: the vampire, the wizard, the, uh, the the vampire, the werewolf, the wizard, the ghost, and the fairy, which you know became the the familiar vampire, werewolf, mage, wraith, and changeling. Um, Mark said, you know, I well, I want the vampires, and I want the werewolves too. And Stuart was like, I want the mages. I don't remember if we mentioned this earlier in the podcast or if this was part of our earlier conversation, Jason, but uh, uh, Stuart is not an actual practitioner of, of magic, but he is very philosophically inclined, and he's very, very well read. Uh, and Stuart said, I... I, the, the way that I he's he's a he's very inspired at least at the time by Robert Piercig's books um, Lila and Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and he said I I've, I've never liked and I agreed with him on this. I, he's like I never liked the idea of mages you know wizards as fireball throwing machines. That's not the way magic works. He. Uh, inspired by uh, Piercig's ideas of, about dynamic reality and the, uh, the the way that certain people will step out of the mainstream and and pull, as he he uh, his metaphor for it was the wheel, <laughs> ratchet the wheel forward, um, and and bring progress. 
um, which then gets locked into stasis until somebody else reaches forward and moves the wheel again. Uh, and he said, I want mages to be the people who move the wheel forward. And so uh, Stuart and Steve and Chris Early uh, spent several years doing a lot of research and doing a lot of writing. And the end result of that was an ambitious mess, to be blunt. Um, I, I, I've read it. Um, it had a lot of good ideas. A, a number of the, those ideas made it into Mage, but it was unreadable uh, on a lot of different levels, and it was unplayable. And that was pointed out to them by several people in White Wolf, at which point uh, Stuart and Steve had the great courage, and I really, I, I really sal uh, salute them on this one, they had the courage to go, you know, you're right, back to the drawing board. And they called in everybody who was involved in White Wolf, which at that point was uh, 13 people, including the folks in the warehouse, and they had these long meetings where in a period of, I think it was three or four weeks, uh, might have been a little bit longer, but not much, they rewrote the entire book. Hmm. Um and uh, they, one of the reasons for the, the infamous things like uh, trench coats and katanas and, and some of the, the weird artwork, including the, the bizarre kind of space battle thing that was on the made screen, is a lot of the art had been commissioned before the book was, before the final version of the book was written. Uh, but in any case... Uh, what was in the original version that ended up um, being left out? Oh, uh, a lot of, there was some of it I, I don't remember. I mean, I read this 25 years ago. Some of it, I, I, I'm not going to embarrass the people involved. There was cut and paste stuff. There was some, some bad history. There was uh, um, a lot of it, though, was it was just very circular. It kind of went in. It, it, it knew what it was trying to say, but it wasn't saying it very articulately, and it wasn't, it wasn't in a playable form yet. Um, a lot of the, 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 the final versions of the traditions and the technocracy and the, the things like that came out of the group discussions uh, that followed that. The, the, they're kind of bits and pieces of it in the original version, but uh, uh, they, they made the freeform magic system uh, out of a variation on um, the version in Ars Magica, the, the freeform sort of freeform ish magic rules in Ars Magica. And during this period, uh, some of them got together and s were looking for more direction. And, and Sam Chubb, who was, I think, the most meta metaphysically inclined person uh, in White Wolf at that time, um, basically called on Bridget and said, um, can you help, <laughs> please? Um, meanwhile, and uh, for those who are listening to the podcast, I was talking to Jason about this a little while ago, um, my life was a complete disaster at that point. I was writing for, uh, for Werewolf as a freelancer, and I'd been a professional writer for a few years, but that wasn't paying very well. Uh, I was working in a shoe store, um, and I loathing, loathing every minute of it. Um, and my, uh, my then wife and I uh, still loved each other very much, but we were a terrible, uh, terrible mix for each other at that time. Um, we were very poor, student loan debt. Um, uh, I was getting paid very little. She had health problems, wasn't able to work. Uh, and we lived in a place that we both dubbed Domestic Abuse Central, which was based on the primary um, pastime of all of our neighbors. It was a high crime area, um, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of, a lot of violence, uh, and just miserable, wretched place. And... Uh, we managed, after several really ugly, literally life-threatening, violent encounters, um, we got out of that place and moved in with our best friend into a slightly better neighborhood, but not in much better conditions. And I, I reached the point where I just kind of went, you know, like I was saying a few minutes ago, God, God is great spirit, whatever it is out there, help me get out of this. Um, and I had been pagan for quite a while by that point. Uh, and uh, I had gotten together I, with realizing that I needed to kind of blow the doors open on all of the vaults that I had stored up in my head. Uh, I went and did a vision quest with uh, an old friend of mine, the two old friends of mine, one, one, one of them uh, a former girlfriend from college, uh, out in San Francisco. I was living in Richmond, Virginia at that time. And... 
uh, during that vision quest, I essentially got the answer, you're going to need to burn your life down in order to build it back up. This is not the answer I wanted to hear. <laughs> So I came back in, in depressed, and my my, my then wife uh, and I started fighting with each other as soon as I got back. And so a few days later, things reached ahead, and I, I literally, you know, was I'm on top of a ladder. This, you can't make this shit up, and I'm not making this shit up. This actually is is how it happened. I was on on a ladder in the uh, in the stock room in the shoe store, um, listening to Joseph Campbell's. Um, and Bill Moyer's Power of Myth, which I'd been listening to on cassette. Um, and I'm just like, I need out of this. Something needs to change. God, God is great spirit. Whatever it is, whoever you are, how do I get out of this? And almost literally, the, the words, you know, apply for the major developer position. Uh, now, as, as I was telling Jason uh, a few hours ago, uh, one of uh, Mark and Stewart's great ideas with, with White Wolf was once a rule book was released, they would hire somebody to be in control of all elements of that line, whether it was vampire. Uh, Andrew Greenberg was the first vampire line developer, uh, and he guided the line. Bill Bridges, uh, my old friend and college roommate, gaming buddy, uh, he was hired for Werewolf, which is how I got the Werewolf writing gig. And... I called Bill up and I'm like, um, I want the mage line developer position. How do I apply for it? And he's like, you don't want this job. And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> and he says, this is in the point, this is the chaos point, you know, where they, where they were literally rewriting the book. And, and, uh, and he says, um, it, everything's a mess right now. It's total chaos. You don't want this job. And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. And he said, you have no idea how much work the, the, this job is. I said, my life is hell. Anything is an improvement. I want that job. So when they finished writing it, um, they had sent me a copy of a uh, copy of it, you know, right out of editing and uh, in, in layout. And uh, they sent it to the other people who were applying for the job as well. And they said, um, Tell us what you read this. Tell us what you like about it, what you don't like about it, what you would do with it, what you would change about it, and what your plans would be if you were in charge of the line. So I took a day off from work, and I wrote up a 26, 28-page um, prospectus of my thoughts, my reflections, what I would do, an outline, outlined a book, I made a, a perspective schedule and so forth, and sent it into them. I went down for Dragon Con, which back in those days, Dragon Con was before Gen Con. Dragon Con was in July and Gen Con was in August. And um, I went down uh, in July to interview for the job and Sam Chupp says, you're the guy. And I'm like, well, I'm what guy? And he says, he tells me about the, the thing which I had heard about from Bill about how they've been having to re re rewrite things. And he said, I called on Bridget and I said, you know, help us fix this. And he said, you're the guy. And... Uh, I'm like, wow. okay, I'm not really entirely sure how to take that. Yeah. Wow, and just to clarify, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Bridget, Bridget meaning St. Bridget, right? Yeah, yeah. well, uh, the, the god of Bridget, Bridget I, it's, I, I don't want to mangle Gaelic by pronouncing it wrong, but it's uh, more, he's very, he's pagan, but this would be uh, the, the, the fire, the fire goddess, ah. and uh, the, Gaelic, the, the, the Celtic fire goddess, and uh, so... Uh, so I sent in my prospectus, and I waited, and I waited, and they called me at work three days before Gen Con and said, we'd like to offer you the job. And as I was bouncing up and down, <laughs> trying to keep my voice steady, um, people, you know, the, the shoe store hugging me and stuff like that, and I borrowed money from my dad. I flew down there, and as I get down there, Bill picks me up at the airport and says, um, we got to talk to you. We, we, we've got to get you to talk one of the guys out of quitting, the guy who's supposed to write the first source book was threatening to quit because he didn't know what to write. He knew he had a deadline coming up and he had no idea what to write. So off the top of my head, I call this guy up. I've never talked to him before. And I tell him how we're going to do the book. That just kind of came out of nowhere. I had no idea what the fuck I was talking about. But I was suddenly I'm like, we're going to do this and this, 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 this. I calm him down. I talk him down. And we say, okay, let's get started on this. And meanwhile, I don't remember if this is before or after I talked to, uh, talked to him. I think it was before. 
But I get in, and I had already met Ken Cliff, who is the head of editing, developing. He hands me the first proof copy of Mage to come back from the printer, because they send a, a, a proof copy in advance before printing up the however many thousand copies you have in an order. He hands me the proof copy. He says, here it is. It's all yours. We don't have the slightest idea what to do with it. <laughs> And I said, how much creative freedom do I have? Well, actually, I, it, was, I, it was much less eloquent than that. I think I was like, so what can I do with this? <laughs> and he says, as long as you don't change any of the major concepts in it immediately, you can do whatever you want. So I did. <laughs> and that was a, those five years were absolutely, the next five years were absolutely insane. Um, in a good way and not and sometimes not a such a good way. Uh, there was... One of the things that was really, really obvious in what we were doing is it's contrary contrary to popular opinion, there was not a lot of, you know, we weren't like casting magic in the halls and stuff like that. The majority of people and staff were not practitioners of anything particularly metaphysical, but everybody was a big thinker. Okay, okay. Um, everybody, there were all people of insight and vision there. And Actually, Owl, going back at one point, he came down, this is 1994 or 5, I think, uh, I will going back and I were working on um, the fragile path, which was kind of a, a mage gospel of sorts. And uh, Owl says, so can I talk to you about something? Said, yeah, sure. He said, how many people around here are people of, of people of vision? I said, well, how do you mean? He says, how many people here really believe? I said, well, um, I can't speak for, for everybody, but I said, I know that there, there are people here of, of power and people here of a vision. I said, the majority of us are just trying to put out a bunch of game books. You know, at that point, you know, we're, we're releasing like a book, a line per month. Wow. So it was an ins absolutely insane schedule. He says, as, as I said, but there, there are people here who know what we're doing. He says, you should all be very careful with, with what you do. He says, because when, when, People, he says, the spirits can sense when people are aware. And he says, and if, if your average person with his eyes closed walks into a room full of demons, they're not going to pay any attention to them because he's not seeing them. He says, but if a person of vision walks into a room full of demons, they're going to take notice. And he says, I'm not going to say there are demons here, but you're working in some very deep waters and you should all be careful about what you do and how you do it. He was right. So how was he right? And, and <laughs> Wraith. Uh, okay, <laughs> you heard of well, the Wraith curse. <laughs> uh, I'm somewhat aware of it. It's possibly the least, uh, well, not least playable, but hardest to play game ever written in, in as much as how psychologically grueling it is. But, um, but let me ask you this. Um, in terms of what you just said and your own experience of magic, because... Mage is such a positive game, and certainly that's what yeah, I re resonate with. optimistic. Yes, uh, and that's that certainly what you know. When I think about magic, I basically mean you know the the power of belief to positively change the world. Um, mm -hmm. And but you know certainly uh, there are people who can at least get paranoid about magic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering <laughs> <David> what Bowie. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's a lot of cocaine involved in that one too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, oh, paranoid about the the abilities of magic. Well, paranoid about maybe par not paranoid or superstitious. You know, when you talk about magic, and certainly this has affected me in my life and my career. When you talk about magic, often the first because of religion or mm -hmm. because of just not understanding it, the first That's reaction. Animals. Yeah, exactly. The first pe reaction people have is fear and it's satanic you, st you still hear that i mean it's been what 30 years since the satanic panic it's right. still every once in a while you mention role-playing games but isn't that satanic right and certainly when you talk about magic as an actual practice you know it mm -hmm. it calls up fear and superstition and and in a way that's kind of almost part of you know part of my own path and getting into magic you know a big part of it was overcoming that stuff and realizing that stuff is by and large not all of it but by and large internal fear and confronting the dragons of internal fear and realizing they really are only internal and that in doing that you begin to 
develop a mastery over not only your own emotional states, but your beliefs and, and illusion, you know? Yeah, yes and no. I've been involved in this for long enough to have seen people who will use magic to fuck other people up. Oh, I've seen a lot of that. I've yeah, seen a lot of that. That's, that's one, and it, another one of the themes, because I absolutely agree with you, and, and I, 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 uh, I share that, how having confronted my own inner demons, although in my case it was I, I, when I was working on Mage back in the old days, I, I used to have these horrible and vivid, very, very powerful nightmares where I was called to confront and or rather called to account for, for the things that I was putting into mage. Wow. And, um, you know, basically the, the celestial voice going, do you know what you've done here? And I would have to defend, it was like being in the dock and I would have to defend what I was doing. And 20 years of hindsight, I absolutely, I, I have, I have seen and I have experienced the proof that what we did was good back then it wasn't nearly as obvious hmm. because there still was a lot of the fear of the satanic panic and all of that. And also, um, quite frankly, uh, some friends of mine in college got mulched absolutely psychically and to a degree physically destroyed um, by a would-be cult leader who was part of our social group. Hmm. Um, but one of them was suffered such severe psychological damage that even now he's a mess. Uh, and a second one who was a mess even before that started, he's in prison. Uh, I've seen firsthand the result of what happens when people are careless with magic, and that's one of the other things that I've put into Mage, and part of that whole be careful what you do, I've seen what happens when people aren't careful, and when yeah. people are, go into it with malignant intent. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that too, and I've had a lot of that. I've been through it as well. I've had, you know, been, you know, mulched, as you put it, in certain points of my life. Um, and learned a lot of, uh, I don't know, re well, I think respect is part of it, but mm -hmm. understanding that there are consequences, as you put it to, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and that, um, other people are real <laughs> is a big mm -hmm. part of it, you yeah. know, <laughs> because I think, especially for young people, when they get into magic, there's this, uh, there can be this rush, you know, compounded with all these scripts from whatever media they've consumed with TV, Hollywood, and things like that. This idea that they are special. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why earlier you were saying, you know, one of the most important things to realize is, you know, there is no better than, you're, you are not better than any other people at any other time, mm -hmm. at any time, rather. Um, and, you know, there can be a real rush when people get a taste of the effectiveness of magic to overstep boundaries and try and force things or force action from other people. And getting mulched is the result of that. Um, and certainly working with dark energies or, or dark practices, uh, you know, has consequences, even if they're only psychological. Mm -hmm. uh, but no. psychological is a pretty big consequence. I was going to say on, only is, and, and this is one of those, and I'm sure one of those metaphysical truths out there that the uh, um, uh, materialists keep missing. Psycholo psychologically is everything. Consciousness yes. is consciousness is a is, is a dimension of reality, and it is every bit as real, if not more real, than the physical, because consciousness is what allows us to apprehend the physical. You know, even mathematics, language, touch, taste, sense, it's still consciousness that allows us to apprehend, process, and put these things into symbols and recognize what the symbols mean. Consciousness is utterly intangible, but it is the, it is the most real form of reality. So things that, are in, things that are real in consciousness, whether or not they have a physical, whether or not they attain a physical dimension, are still real. And yeah, that's, <laughs> absolutely. that's something a lot of people forget. And, and the thing that goes with that is if everyone else around you agrees that they're real, mm -hmm. then that is reality, you know, and that yeah. is, that's physical reality, essentially, because mm -hmm. then your life is defined by that. And I think it was either uh, David Hume or Bishop Berkeley, one of them talks about, you know, there really is we have nothing outside of our own perception. We're essentially mm -hmm. locked in our own, locked inside of our own consciousness because there is no way to prove that anything outside of our um, you know, uh, uh, five senses is, is real because we only have our objects of sense perception. Um, and so, you know, belief 
carried to a certain degree really does create reality. And obviously that's what advertisers and corporations know and why they're so interested in all of this stuff in, in terms of shaping belief and shaping exactly. mass belief just in the way that this used to be in Mage the Ascension or Alan Moore comics, you know, it's like th mm -hmm. this is no, this is actually bedrock reality of, of the corpocracy as you put it. But certainly, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's no just psychological or just consciousness. Um, that really is, um, you know, and I, I can talk about like for, when I talk to my, my completely materialist friends mm -hmm. and I talk about some of my experiences and I'll say things like, well, yeah, I, you know, I had a friend or I was at, at a certain point, you know, completely wrapped up in all kinds of crazy, you know, horrible experiences that I had from magic or getting mixed up in, in, you know, dark magic and stuff like that. And they'll just roll their eyes and say, well, that, yeah, but that, that's not real. Come on. You know, it's like, well, if you believe it's real and it's real for you, then that, def you know, that defines, you know, a traumatic mm -hmm. experience or it defines a, a, a transcendent experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's the trend. The transcendent is whether you're whether you're talking from a, a a mystical or a technological or an artistic or whatever other uh, perspective you whatever other label you want to apply to it. The transcendent experience is something that any human. I would say any. I don't want to speak for every every living person ever, but most human beings have experienced it, whether or not they had words for how they processed it. I believe animals uh, have transcendent moments as well. Uh, we're, we're beginning to more, more and more, ironically, by way of science and science getting out of its own way, we're realizing that the, uh, the, the animals that we share this, uh, the, this, this ball of rock with are in their own ways as sentient and as emotional as we are. Um, once we, we finally stop you know, having... Uh, white dudes in white coats shocking monkeys in, in cages and trying to teach them our language and then saying, oh, there's nothing intelligent there and started realizing that a cat thinks like a cat, but the cat is still thinking. The cat feels like a cat, but the cat is still feeling. It's still a thinking, feeling entity just like you. Um, and we, you know, again, we've started by way of... Uh, by way of everything from EKGs to to uh, to satellite videos, realizing oh you know they they actually do think. I believe that that animals as well as humans have transcendent experiences. So, getting off that tangent, the transcendent experience is not uh, is is not limited by physical reality. It transcends by literally it transcends physical reality. That's what the that's what the sort of experience is. That was an interesting tangent. Um, <laughs> Um, I want to go back to what you uh -huh. were saying a few minutes ago and mention one of those things that has changed since the uh, since the old days that ties in with what you were just saying about the rush of power um, is the rise of, by way of the uh, the Internet in particular, the rise of consent culture. The idea that what a person on the other end of whatever it is you're doing um, deserves a say, you know, should morally uh, have a say and, and, and that your effect what you're doing has an effect on them whether you whether you care about that or not and that you should care about that mm. uh in uh mages uh the new mage 20 source book how do you do that there's a section on uh, uncanny influence which is you know mind control charms and things like that there's a big section almost a, almost a page long about the question of consent and whether or not you're mind raping somebody when you use that love spell or you use that, you know, that Jedi mind trick yes. or whatever. Uh, yes. And that in, you know, old school magic, you know, they don't care about that sort of thing. Yes. But that maybe, especially in the 21st century, maybe you should. Yes. And when I actually, that it's, I'm really glad you touched on that. Um, in the, because I teach classes on chaos magic online. And mm. one of the, the, I very, I harp on that very heavily and i basically say that when you, you when you're doing magic you should really only do magic on yourself mm -hmm. um if you and if you if you want to have a uh, if you want a safe ride or a safe enough ride outside of dealing mm -hmm. with your own shadow fragments and your own uh you know your own un, your own unprocessed trauma and so on and so forth um and self-integration which is hard enough in itself without you know getting into anything else um you should really only be doing magic on yourself to, you know, instead of doing, for instance, a love spell to make someone fall in love with you, 
you should mm-hmm. be doing magic on yourself to make yourself more lovable. Hell yes. Yeah, you know, or more, you know, a, a better person essentially, or, de- you know, that it really should be about self-development and that that's actually easier in the long run because, you know, as I pointed out on this podcast, actually, it's like, you know, what's what's more economically viable in terms of time and effort getting into a bad relationship with somebody that wasn't meant to be with a love spell or turning yourself into an, a person that people want in their lives, at which point mm-hmm. you will never, you know, you'll be, have to, t- you'll be turning people down because people will want to be around you. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. and, and so, and so consent. And for that reason, you know, I always tell people, it's like, you know, I have people do safety checks and ecology checks on what they're doing. And if there's no consent framework, you can't, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that you can't do it and not expect to be hit in the head uh, by the other person. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And I and I include in that even interfe- trying to interfere in somebody's life in a positive way. Mm-hmm. You know, in the sense of uh, there's a classic story Dion Fortune told about people who were doing healing magic on somebody without their permission, right, or without them knowing about or without their consent, essentially. And uh, then I think this must have been in the 20s or 30s uh, in Dion Fortune's magical group. And then they get this letter back from him who said, say, saying, thank you very much for healing me. I've now, you know, regained the strength I needed to kill myself. <laughs> and this may or may not be a spurious story. It sounds slightly exaggerated to say the least, mm-hmm. but it's an interesting teaching story, at least mm-hmm. in the sense of... Um, you know, to try and do magic on somebody else already presumes unequal spiritual status and is therefore, like, as in, you know what's better for them than they do, uh, what's right for them and they do not, uh, and therefore are more spiritually aware than them. And that's automatically grounds for, you know, major wreckage and fuck up. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the one of the core assumptions of the Ascension War. One, one of the elements, and I, we talked about this a little while ago, but I don't know if it made it into the podcast or not, is the element of satire in Mage. Okay. Uh, Mage is on, on many different levels uh, intentionally satirical, and it's more obvious. You know, this, that level of satire is more obvious in Werewolf, obviously, but wow, that was a good sentence. <laughs> anyway... But one of the ideas that, that Mage satirizes, and it's it's very rarely, though occasionally, satire done with, you know, the sort of like the Batwing Chihuahua um, science experiment sort of satire. It's more a satire of the people going, oh, but we have to save reality, and we're going to save reality because we are, we, we are fragments of the pure ones, and so we're going to bring the world back to the golden age where we sacrificed people in the grove and so forth because that was so much better <laughs> than those damn machine people yes. over there. Yeah, that's satirical, and yes, I, I think that's an idiotic idea, and so one of the ideas running through Mage for as long as I've been doing it and is running through Mage again is the idea of check, check your assumptions, check your privilege. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, you, you may have mastered Anakia and, and, and risen to the uh, risen to the 10th degree of whatever, 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 and you know this sigil and you command this spirit and check your privilege, dude. Right. <laughs> you're, and, you're a douche. <laughs> and yet everyone around you can actually hold down a job and you can't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you yeah. know, uh, you know, I think that you know, magic, particularly the old style ceremonial magic, there's really a component missing there that I had to discover through trial and error and then through slaves. some study of what's that? <laughs> Sorry. That would be being sarcastic. That was slaves. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, <laughs> yes, there's some, yeah. Um, but the sense that, um, well, no, that's true in a way because a lot of these hierarchical orders you look at. Oh, it's totally true. And, uh, you know, and you go back and, yeah, I mean, like they came out of feudal societies. And that's something mm-hmm. that I think, you know, White Wolf was, was spot on about. But even even if you look at Tibetan Buddhism, you know, which people mm-hmm. hold up as this paragon of virtue, it's like that was a, a theocratic feudal slave society. It was a horror show. It was a, the, the reason people think that the, 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 the Chinese communists came rolling over there and just took over, no, the people were asking the Chinese to intervene because mm. the, the monks were so horrific to the average Tibetan. Yes. there's a, they, they were monsters. They, oh they tortured people. Yes. Uh, yes. My understanding, and I don't have historical validation of this, but uh, there's a good book about this called The Shadow of the Dalai Lama, which goes mm-hmm. into the, you know this one? Yeah. Um, which is a bit spurious possibly spurious in its own right because it was written by 
um, uh, fundamentalist Catholics uh, potentially under Vatican employees. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. But they, they really uh, talk about a lot of the, the horrors that went on there, particularly when you live in a, in a society where everyone is assumed to reincarnate and killing somebody doesn't really do much. You know, how is mm -hmm. order enforced? And I'll leave that to people's imagination. But um, mm -hmm. the... The thing that Western magicians and traditional ceremonial magicians always miss is that everyone is essentially equally, I don't want to use the word divine, but you know, one consciousness is just like another consciousness. They just wear different clothes. Um, mm. And so you can know all this Enochian and be the 10th degree of whatever order, but that doesn't make you any different from the person who run, is, you know, runs the gas station next to you in any type mm. of fundamental ontological way. It just means you know some nice party tricks and that you can direct your will and imagination in interesting ways that other people can't, but just because you're directing your will and imagination you know, you might, but you might be directing 100% of your will and imagination into mastering the Enochian tablets, and somebody else may be directing 100% of their will and imagination into paying off a mortgage, but they're essentially the same in the grand ontological scheme of things. So I find it, it's incredibly important for people to understand that because the Otherwise, what happens is this fantasy of hierarchical orders or special spiritual status. And I think the way the, the how you called out earlier that um, the corruption or the root of corruption is thinking that you are better than other people was was mm -hmm. spot on, um, and uh, it just doesn't bear. You know, it just doesn't work. It doesn't bear out in reality. It only leads to suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's the the ascension war on the the uh, the the ascension war, which is one of the 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 dramatic um, what's the word out the conflict dynamic. Uh, within uh, within mage is on one hand um, it's the idea of elevating yourself to to the highest to the highest potential you know, to the highest possible plane of transcendence and and uplifting the rest of the world and the flip side of it is a is, is a metaphysical imperialism and a metaphysical fascism in which your reality becomes everybody's reality because of course you know what's best and everybody in mage is guilty of it mm. Every faction in Mage is guilty of it. That's that's one of the reasons the Nefandi, um, who I, on some levels have the most open eyes about this <laughs> whole thing, it's one of the reasons the Nefandi in in the Mage in Mage twentieth in particular are the actual big bad, because the Nefandi are going. We recognize what we are. Hmm. You're deluding yourselves. When I get you to stop deluding yourself. Or when I employ, better yet, when I employ your delusions to my ends, I'm proving that I'm right, and you will prove that you are wrong. Uh huh. And we don't need Cthuloid monsters, and we don't need to sacrifice children. Oh, we'll we think the Cthuloid monsters might be kind of neat, and sacrificing children. Well, that just furthers my ends, and besides, it's fun. <laughs> um, you know, obviously from a Nefandic standpoint, um, but. They're like, we, we don't need those things. Those are just trappings. What we do is we get you to betray your own beliefs, and, and you'll do it, hmm. and you'll think you're absolutely right. I, I got in <laughs> it's a, um, a subject of some debate where on one of the forums I said that Dick Cheney was, uh, was, was the perfect example of the Nefandic, of Nefandic tactics. Hmm. And you know somebody was like, oh, liberal politics. Why are you bringing your liberal politics into it? And I'm like, okay. Let's remove political bias from this entirely. Let's just deal specifically with facts. This is a man who assumed the second highest, you know, the second highest office in the world. He used that office, or I should say, I'm not even. I'll, I'll even take out the pejorative he used. While he was in that office, the country that he was second in charge of, possibly first in charge mm -hmm. of, depending on how you yes. look at it, yes. um, invaded a nation on false pretenses, killing at least half a million, possibly more than a million of its people, instituted torture chambers and tried to make that, you know, tr essentially argued that that was okay. Um, sent a mercenary army onto American soil uh, in, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina with orders to kill American citizens. Um, gave no-bid contract to his friends. 
and pocketed money from that. Use some of the money that he got from that to buy himself a new heart. <laughs> you know, by 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 essentially bribing the uh, the the cardiac and the the car rather the cardiac institute that that has done all of it's literally it's kept him alive. Uh, I said he shot one of his own friends in the face and got that guy to apologize to him. <laughs> And you're defending him. Yes. That's how an offendus works. Yes. And in the end, and <laughs> after all of people that. People thinking that he was a great guy and he right. did these things. And I said, and that, I guess that's not, that's not liberal politics. That's, that's not liberal bias. That's not liberal politics. These are things he did. And at the end of it. Uh, at the end his, of it, you're thinking he's a great guy. Right. And you're thinking, I'm wrong for pointing right. this out. At, in, in Congratulations. His wake, you, in just, his wake, you just proved my point. It's like, wow, maybe he, maybe he was... Maybe he saw something we didn't, and he was just, you know, doing the right thing from his perspective. That's the scary well, that, thing about it. That's the scary thing is to his perspective, he is doing the right thing, hmm. and so are the Nefandi. Because right. the, what what the Nef- what the Nefandi see is they're like they're like, no, we we see the world as we see the universe as what it is, implacable darkness inhabited by 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 somewhat intelligent monkeys who. Have an exal- have have an, an exalted sense of their own importance and don't notice the worms eating their you know, eating their innards. We this, see this. <laughs> this reminds me of the um, uh, the concept of the cliffhoth in uh, mm-hmm. in ceremonial magic, uh, and that the you know my experience of of cliffhoth and cliffhotic working being that you know you know clearly seeing one's own internal corruption and one's one's own inverse and mm-hmm. being utterly consumed by it and not not ne- and not even in a nice Jungian shadow work kind of way but in a like in a total corruption kind of way um, and that's what I kind of see happening with people on the internet for instance as well mm-hmm. is that people are so confronted with corruption or cliffhoth that you know there are ide- it's like it's this this uh, cliffhotic or abyssal experience of people's um, humanity being erased Exactly. Well, and that's funny you should mention. And Cheney started that, that, I think. I think that that attitude in this country, at least that the, I think the, the combination of, for instance, by way of demonstrating this, the revelation that the U.S. was torturing people, and the mm-hmm. corrosion that unleashed within people's inner being, that mm-hmm. the supposed authorities are torturing people, and then at the same time, you know, shortly thereafter, we're getting like the Saw movies. No, I, yeah. actually, the Saw movie started before that, but, uh, but okay. it is—it right. was an interesting conflux with pop popular culture and and enhanced interrogations <laughs> that you had. You know, Twenty Four, which Twenty Four was done by the same folks who did La Femme Nikita in the nineties, and in La Femme Nikita, Section One was torturing people and going, but you know, this is this is the expedient thing to do, and the main character was going, "What the fuck is wrong with you? You're as bad as they are." Yes. Um, and they're like, well, we got the answers that we needed. And she's like, but at the cost of being as bad as they are, there's no difference. You're doing the same thing they're doing. And, and that was a message in La Femme Nikita. In 24, it was just like, dun, 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 dun. save the world, torture this guy, torture this guy, torture this guy, because <laughs> the world is... And it's from the same people. And the, at least in the first season, I only watched the first season of 24, but in the first season, that moral ambiguity was still there. Um, Jack, you're kind of fucked up, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that a lot of people took the took 24 as an example of what we should be doing. I don't know. I didn't watch it past the first season, but the first season was was definitely morally ambiguous about whether or not Jack was crazy. Um, I, I would like if they kept that moral ambiguity, but people kind of suck at reading moral ambiguity, yes. no matter yes, how obvious do. it may be. Um, funny you mentioned the uh, the Jungian shadow. With uh, uh, Klipoth is Klipoth. Uh, I don't speak Hebrew, um, so because I I don't know if anyone else sees, but I've always seen when I started learning about it. I was looking at it as oh, so that's God's shadow over there. That's God's repressed shadow. That's hmm. God's fuck ups. Uh, that's <laughs> the stuff that God screwed up and doesn't want to admit to. <laughs> and so that's all bad and demons. And over there. And the, in the process of exploring that, you're starting to realize, okay, so this is this is the stuff God God doesn't want to admit. <laughs> I like that. That's really yes. 
Yeah, and then yeah, uh, that's the, the revelation funny. that everyone is kind of fucked up, including the you know all authority figures, all the uh, you know even even our heroes are kind of a little fucked up. Um, that's that's pretty sobering. But I definitely it's you know it's interesting to go back to the optimism of mm-hmm. culture in the '90s, even though it was wearing leather trench coats. You know the the core optimism of it compared to, you know, I think just the, and I'm thinking of, I've talked about this bef- before, but the the optimism that was inherent in the counterculture, whether it was Mage or um, the work of people like Douglas Rushkoff or Ken Wilber or Grant Morrison, um, mm-hmm. and that there was such Alan this Moore. sense of yes, Alan Moore, and there's such this sense of um, that we were on the cusp of you know, the big magical revolution and, you know, the, the, the matrix coming out, obviously drawing on all these things without giving, giving them credit. Um, but th- that was very, you know, instrumental in this sense of some and rave culture and the sense that something big was going to happen, but that the world kind of collectively blew it with nine eleven and went back to, and just the sense of, and I think, I feel like, you know, obviously, you know, Bernie Sanders, for instance, is, is, uh, people's hope in him is is different than this, I hope. But uh, there's just been this sense of collective guilt and corrosion, and um, this sense of we are the bad guys. You know that was so prevalent through the Bush years, and then to a large extent in the Obama years, to the point where Trump seems like a good idea to people somehow, mm-hmm. and that doing the wrong thing seems like the, a good idea. You know that people are reveling in in lowest common denominator and certainly things like Gamergate and 4chan and the internet and MRAs are, are a part of that. Um, but just the collective kind of breakdown of the world soul. And I feel like part of the duty of artists certainly mm-hmm. and magically inclined artists absolutely is to have this, is to constantly have a restoration or restitution of the world soul and demonstrate people's higher values to them because like you just pointed out, they're often not too good about um, telling their own stories to themselves, you know, or, or remembering what it is to be human. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, oh, that's and kind I, of a rant, like but, but, um, Oh no, I totally agree with you. Well, I, I agree with you up, up until up to one point. Okay. And and it's funny this ties into something that one of one of my bandmates said just last night. Um, we've always been fucked up. Um, the, and again, the more you read, the more you read history, the more like, wow, you know, on a lot of levels, for as much as things are screwy now, they used to be a whole lot worse. Um, I do absolutely believe, and I I put this up on my uh, put this up on my Facebook as a post a few days ago that I believe that it is our duty and our responsibility in this life to bring kindness uh, into the world because the universe is implacable and there are constantly forces around us bringing in pain and suffering. Therefore, you know, therefore it's our responsibility to, con- to, to counteract them as much as possible. Um, part of... Uh, that, that's a that's a tangent I can go into more in a little bit. But, that's totally um, true. And I, I, well, I just want to add to that briefly. You know, the that is very hard to do because yeah, the is. wrong thing is always easier to do. Exactly, and it, it's hard. I mean, like like I said, you know, when 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 Kathy, my my ex wife, and I were were feeling our relationship falling apart around us, much as we loved each other very intensely, when we were literally living in in a building. Um, crawling with roaches no matter what we did when we were listening to our neighbors get drunk and beat each other, beat children um, in the middle of the night listening to, to children scream know that you know one of, one of our neighbors was beaten almost to death with a baseball bat another one was shot to death by his ex-girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend when you live in that when you see that, when that's your life and that's your existence, it's hard to believe in something better, which makes it all the more important that you do and that's that's what drives me is defiant optimism it's not a denial of the darkness it's a realization that we can be better than that and that that realization that if we don't do it it might not get done 
um, that if you know if I don't write this thing or or Anthony doesn't tell this story or you don't do this podcast, that there will be people whose lives will be darker, whose lives will be more painful, that there'll be more suffering, that they have less hope. That's one of the things that keeps me doing it. Uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I, I made a joke way back before this podcast started recording. I made a joke to uh, uh, to Jason that you know if, if I wanted money, I wouldn't be still writing and role playing games. But actually, this is an important thing to me because I have God knows I have found myself over and over and over again wondering why the hell I'm still writing in this medium because it pays very poorly and as a frequent rueful jo- joke of mine is where the people, the comic book folks look down on um, <laughs> is because no other medium is as active in uh, is, 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 an act, is, is as actively engaging as role playing. Um, I've got a number of articles on my blog, uh, which is Satoru's Phil, Satoru's Phil Brucato, um, uh, at uh, wordpress.com. I've got articles on what I call aspecting, which is tapping into Jungian po- and post Jungian um, psychology and the idea that uh, the, the various things, the various selves uh, that we manifest in different situations, whether it's you know, the person you are with your mom, the person you are with your boss, and the person you are with your lover, not the same person, even though they're still you, that in most people are unconscious. Uh, about how about how we use those things and how we become those people in role playing you are consciously creating aspects of yourself you are consciously using elements of your yourself in this fictional character and putting them through these vicar- vicariously putting them through these through these imaginary challenges on some level on a psychic level of reality you are sending an element of yourself out to go face challenges that even though imaginary in the physical sense are still real in the conscious sense. The shadow side of this is what people were afraid of with the bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, that it is possible to get so caught up in that that you lose sight of your physical reality. I've seen this happen. I'm not saying, you know, the bothered about Dungeons and Dragons people were right, but I have seen people who take games way too seriously, and <coughs> Gamergate <coughs> um, <laughs> is, yeah, is a perfect example. Um, but the benefits of consciously choosing to create aspects of yourself and to consciously send them into adventures and consciously experience things that are impossible in physical reality uh, and impossible in your daily life, I think that's ultimately a positive thing because it inspires you to open up the elements in your real life that you can change. Uh, And I know that there is a lot in the there's a lot in, in role-playing games in fantasy in general that inspires people to want better and to be better. And a novel or a series of novels, <coughs> Harry Potter, um, oh. can inspire people to want better and to be better. And you know, to be better in life in a role-playing game, you can actually be the Harry, the Harry or the Hermione or or. Uh, you know, who, whomever else, yeah, you could you could choose to be um, Slytherin too, and maybe you can even find some enlightenment in that. But um, through through role playing games and as, as through theater, which I have a the- theatrical background, um, through role playing games, you can consciously take this person, take this part of yourself, and go, okay, so this is what this part of myself looks like. I give her a name. I give her. You know the, this these skills. I give her these abilities, and I send her into these challenges. And this is who this is what she brings back to me, and brings back to my real life. Um, I became conscious of this in uh, in college when I was majoring in theater, um, and was uh, writing in my acting journal, and realizing that my role playing characters were aspects and elements of my of of my psychological self. Um, and so I've consciously brought that into role playing from the very beginning of, of my work as a designer and an author. Um, the more I have seen of of the world, the more I've experienced of the world, the more I think that it's important for people to be able to do that and to have a safe space to do that. Um, I think the safe space part is important, which is why I fucking hate the Gamergate assholes because mm. they're removing that safety from other people. Yes. Um, but the the medium itself is intensely positive 
when used with positive intentions uh, and, and consciously. Uh, I, I know a few people, well, my, my girlfriend, Coyote, is, uh, and, and I'm not, you know, opening, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, revealing any skeletons here. She is on the autistic spectrum. She had said that role-playing games have allowed her to connect more with the reality, with, with the people around her, given her tools and terms um, and, and, and a structure for interaction in a world that seems otherwise puzzling to her. Hmm. I've met a lot of people on the spectrum in, in fantasy in general, and I think that's one of the things fantasy does. Hmm. It gives us a, a, sim, a, a, a framework um, and symbols and a language to express and to connect in ways that the mainstream world doesn't. Magic is the same way, and I think that's where I, I find um, some of the crossover between... Uh, what I call gaming the magic avatar, and I have an, an article by that name, uh, which I had originally written for uh, New Witch Magazine, but which is up on my blog now, uh, that that gaming, that magic avatar, can help us to a greater sense of self-realization if we, if and when we do it consciously. Hmm. I think I think that um, group magic, when done with positive intent, can certainly be the same because it gives mm -hmm. people a it gives people kind of a script to have a, a intense experience with each other in a way that is hopefully, you know, safe and 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 scripted so that it's not or or not scripted potentially. Well the but, important the important thing is that again that safe space which is again yes. that that's a concept that hardly even existed. I don't think it had a name in the 90s and something that's become very much a part of my life since then. And uh uh, getting more involved in Tantra as I did in the, uh, the, the very late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, my involvement with uh, kink communities, uh, polyamory, and uh, the ecstatic dance community had brought me more, and the, uh, uh, the nonviolent communication uh, communities have introduced um, ideas and terminology to me that did either I didn't know or that didn't flat out didn't exist when I was doing mage the first time and I'm bringing them more into mage now but uh, that idea of safe space the yes. idea of consent culture uh, this is part of not only part of where where my head is at and, and part of what I'm bringing into mage but I think it's part of that 21st century transformation uh, going back to what you were saying a little while ago I disagree that the world is more fucked up than it was. I, okay. I'm 51 years old. I, I remember the 60s. The 60s were fucked up. Okay. The 70s were, were even worse. My, my, concept, my memory, as much as I, I had a blast during the 90s, my memory of the 90s it was, is that it was an angry hangover from the Reagan years. Hmm. Um, I think on a lot of levels we are in that magic awakening. Yes. And the flip side of that is the religious fundamentalism. Um, but that we are having that 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 awakening period, but we're and kind of in in an in, in an alchemical sense, uh, we're in the putrefaction stage where the old structures are breaking down so that the new structures can uh, can emerge, and they are emerging in the ideas of consent culture, in the ideas of of gender respect, yes, in the ideas of of, of enhanced idea uh, in enhanced concepts and consciousness of gender and identity yes uh, again these the the going back to what my friend said a few uh, yesterday is we had been talking about um some of the problematic elements of of like 70s rock and 80s rock and so forth and the, the misogyny the homophobia and the racism yes. even from the most quote-unquote innocuous the people that we look up to and they're still you know slinging around I love Patti Smith dearly, but rock and roll nigger. She thought that it was, it was, she was making a particular point in that song, and she was actually quoting, or not quoting, but referencing um, uh, Yoko Ono's statement that woman is the nigger of the world. Yes. But she, she felt for a while, I'm perfectly fine at flinging that word around, being a white woman. Now we realize that's problematic. We right. go, huh. But that's just it. As my friend, uh, as my friend said last night, when I was, you know, he, he says, you know, when, when I was a kid in the 80s, these were just words. They didn't mean anything. They were just part of the part of the landscape. Like, yeah, unless you were black or unless you were gay or unless you were Asian or unless you were female, at which point you're just hearing your friends saying whatever words. And, well, 
it's not offending them, so why should it offend you, right? And now we realize that that's actually not true. Right, right. I, I take that as a plus. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you on the, um, you know, the, putre, the putrefactio stage of the Aeon of Horus. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and absolutely, we're seeing, you know, uh, certainly theocratic religion as, as absurd, I, I'd mm-hmm. hope, you know, as it... it, it does its final death thrash uh, around the world? It's killing a lot of people in the process. Yes, and, and it's going to think I'm going. To, I think it's going to kill a lot more. I hope it doesn't kill us all. That's right. still a possibility. But the, just to have the internet to be able to see, and the, you know, the mm-hmm. great revelation of seeing, uh, you know, what's on the other end of our fork, as William Burroughs put it, um, mm-hmm. really, uh, it's it's. I'm glad you 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 steered it back into a positive direction or a more a more uh, a, diff- a slightly different frame because yes i mean even to think about how much we've changed since the beginning of the world wide web it's it's unfathomable mm-hmm. you know unfathomable um but i really do like your uh you know your how you were talking about the point of magic being and the point of you know just being alive of Re- being remaining conscious and uh, putting kindness into the world instead of uh, causing more darkness and suffering. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is basically what magic should be about. And I think that that's what I try to get across, hopefully, you know, not always, but um, there's mm-hmm. a part in. Uh, you know, in the uh, I think it, when people got to kind of the end of the Golden Dawn structure, or around Gabura, they were you mm-hmm. know given the magical sword and said essentially you know here here's the magical sword with this you will keep out the forces of darkness and the Cliffoth from the magical circle, meaning mm-hmm. you know doing essentially what you're saying, which is trying to hold the line between I wouldn't even say light and dark, but between what is good at what between what is human and what is inhuman because well, what, we're we're so mm-hmm. confronted with the forces of um disintegration and corruption and putrefaction and inhumanity um and uh so i think that that's of, of critical importance uh and and is so easily lost in in our current moment when the internet allows so much anonymity and it's so easy to not do the right thing. Mm-hmm. True, although pu- uh, the, the, the breakdown, the, the putrefaction, the darkness, these things are all necessary too. Uh, that's a part, and, and one of the, there's, there's a marvelous book, and I, I, I highly recommend this to, to, to you if you haven't read it and to anyone listening to this podcast, um, called the Dark Side of the Light Chasers. Uh, yes, I've heard Ford. of this. I haven't read it, but I, I yes, this sounded like a good book. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. And while I'm on the subject of recommending things for this, this came up in a conversation before we were recording. Uh, I highly recommend to anyone listening to this uh, Eric Davis's books, particularly the book Technosis, uh, N O G I. Um, I'm dyslexic, so gnosis, but with gnosis with an with a gn. Okay. Uh, but technosis, magic, myth, and mysticism in the age of information. Uh, because uh, Eric runs down a lot of the things of the last, particularly the last few decades. Even though the book ca- itself came out over 15 years ago, it's it's a remarkably prescient and and very dense and enjoyable book. Uh, but my point there is, and th- this is actually a point I make in Mage is that the, the darkness and the decay and the breakdown, those things are necessary too. Uh, and in the reason I, I bring up Dark Side of the Light Chasers, in saying I'm going to lock that out, you are falling into the trap of, and I'm not saying you personally, but people fall into the trap by saying, I am the light, I am the light, I will be the light, I will drive out the darkness, that people fall into the darkness by blinding themselves with their own obsession and their own self-righteousness. We see this with ISIL. We see this with with, uh, religious fundamentalists, uh, the people who are so dedicated to I will drive out the light, I will drive out the darkness, are the people who manifest it most strongly. The Bush administration, perfect example. Um, And one of the things that I, I 
I took into Mage when uh, when when uh, when I got it uh, in the early '90s was Stuart, and, and, and by way of Robert Piercig, was saying there is dynamic and there is static. There is dynamic and there is static. You know the 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 wheel moves forward and then it ratchets and then it moves forward and then it ratchets. I said, where's entropy? Is it entropy is part of the cycle too? And if you deny it, then it will it will take it will destroy the cycle because it, entropy is part part of. Well, without going into a long dissertation about this one, um, my eventual what eventually brought me to uh, to paganism was, and I'd mentioned some of this to Jason earlier. I may have even mentioned it earlier in the podcast, but. Uh, I went through a, a very powerful experience with the uh, with evangelical Christianity in my early teens, which quickly turned into this is all fucked up because I started reading the Bible and watching the people around me and going, first of all, your Bible is problematic, and second of all, you're not doing what your Bible says anyway. Um, so I started investigating other religions, explored you know, Judaism, Islam, uh, Taoism, Buddhism, the many, many things that can that are grouped together as Hinduism, Native American spirituality, and, and I, I, the more I looked at these things, I said, everybody's got little bits of the truth, but everybody's also fucked up in the things that they do with it. And so I, I like like with my, um, my, my prayer, really, to, to God, God has great spirit, or, yeah, um, I was saying, well, um, what what's the answer here? Because I said, I, I, I feel that there's something powerful going on here, but I keep seeing people screw it up. And the answer that I got was, the, don't, don't get mired in the works of man. And, and it almost is invariably men, <laughs> not women, uh, not trans people, men. Um, so don't get mired in the works of men. Because the works of men are limited by the view by, by the by the vision of men, and they are thus flawed. If you want to know the truth of divinity, look at the work of divinity. Look at nature. So I did. I started watching, and, I, and I, you know, I still do. I don't spend nearly as much time out in nature as I would like to, especially not doing what I do. But I started watching for the cycles, watching the way animals are when you know when when they're not you know in cages. Um, you know, watching the rain, looking at tree bark, and so forth. Um, I've got a passage about that in uh, the the first Cult of Ecstasy book about the miracle, the 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 the, the infinite miracle in in your just glancing at your fingertip and realizing what your fingertip, what constitutes your fingertip, and the fact that you're able to to apprehend what constitutes your fingertip is an infinite miracle in and of itself, and people just don't see it. Um, but as I started looking beyond words, because words are ultimately human symbols for apprehending something that is beyond words. I started looking at the way creation works, and the way that creation works is things are born, they live, they die, they go back, they live again, they, uh, they exact cycle, 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 cycle. And saying, I will shut out the darkness, I will shut out entropy, I will shut out decay, is denying what is what is there, what is necessary, and it ultimately blinds people. Hmm. And so, that ultimately leads to corruption. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well put. So let me ask you this to wrap up our conversation because we're, we're yeah, getting to, I think, your, your cutoff. It's almost 4 p.m. Um, mm-hmm. uh, for somebody who is, I'm not going to say magic, but for somebody who is looking to consciously approach the world and with an understanding that they're, you know, uh, capable of shaping it, or uh, uh, what do you think the most important thing for them to be bearing in mind is? I don't want to say doing, but mm-hmm. what is the, how do you recommend people stay conscious, essentially? Respect. Treat treat your world, walk through your world, move through your world with, well, it's not even your world. Move, move through the world as you apprehend it with respect. Respect other people. Respect animals because they are a form of people. Um, respect yourself um, and realize that no matter who you are, 
no matter how you do it, what you do affects your world, and your world affects you in return. Be mindful of that, and be mindful of your effect. Bring kindness, and bring kindness when, when you can. Bring respect, whether you're being kind or not. Um, and realize that the, the, the creation is bigger than you are, but you are a part of it, and that we are all interrelated, uh, whether we notice that and whether we recognize that or not. Aha. Uh -huh. well, thank you very much. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. And, and um, uh, you have a band show coming up and probably some other stuff you yes. want people to know about. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well... Uh, as we were talking about, and I think this part didn't get recorded, but uh, uh, Mage itself, the Mage 20 series, is available on Drive Through RPG. The fourth book is at press now. Uh, the, the, the first three books out is the, the Mage Quick Starter, uh, which is a, a sort of a, a very, very a cliff notes basically to Mage 20. Uh, Mage the Ascension 20th Anniversary itself is is out and available in several different editions. Uh, how do you do that, uh, which is a practical guide to sphere magic, the rules and the systems, not magic as a, as a practice itself, uh, is available, and a, um, an anthology called Truth Beyond Paradox, so a collection of uh, 17 short stories by various authors, uh, just went to press and will be available shortly. Um, I'm currently working on several other books, but that would that's a whole other conversation. In terms of what I'm doing immediately, I'm in a band called Telesterion. Uh, we call our, we refer to ourselves as Mystic Rock, um, and our, <laughs> our lead singer uh, refers to us as if Black Sabbath and Fleetwood Mac had a baby. Uh, we have a gig coming up on March 4th in uh, in Seattle over at uh, Studio Seven, and we have uh, we go into the studio uh, to start recording our first album in uh, in March. Uh, we've got several other gigs lined up, including a um, we're booked to be playing a, con a, a convention, first year convention in November called We Are All SF. I highly recommend listener uh, that the listeners to this podcast check out the We Are SF uh, website. And if the website's up yet, <laughs> I'm not sure they've posted the website yet, but but. Uh, uh, keep that in mind. I am also working on a series of books that are not White Wolf, uh, that are that are uh, my uh, created by myself and my partner, Sandra Buskirk, of Power Chords, Music, Magic, and Urban Fantasy. Um, that's a series of books that connect my, uh, my, my love of role-playing with my love of music and my experience in musical culture uh, and uh, my, my love of magic and things magical. Uh, the first book of that is in layout now. Uh, several other books are at various stages of the writing, and I have some excerpts from that on my blog. Uh, my blog is Satoros Philbrucato, E-Y-R-O-S-P-H-I-L-B-R-U-C-A-T-O, at wordpress.com. Say that one more time because I think the Skype got a little garbly when you were saying oh, okay. that, as if on cue. Uh, uh, which part? Just the URL. Oh, okay. As uh, Satoros, uh, Satoros Filbrucato at WordPress.com. That's S A T Y R O S, Phil Brucato at WordPress. Uh, and I've got articles there, essays going back several years, and de dealing with everything from economics and government to uh, my fantasex gaming, my, 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 uh, my fantasex gaming spectrum of sexual explicitness in RPGs. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, let's check those check those things out. Um, <laughs> I'm a compulsive, really creative person who's always working in different media. Um, so I've always got a ton of projects going on. And I also uh, I, on Facebook, uh, I have a uh, Sodoros Filbrucato author page. So I generally post about my my projects there, and I have a Patreon account because art pays for shit, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and especially because I I collaborate with a lot of people, and I pay the people I collaborate with. My Patreon not only supports me and my projects, it supports me paying the people I work with. So the more the more that uh, the more support I can get with that, the more I can do, and the more I can pay people uh, when they work with me. All right. Well, so please, <laughs> yep. Yes. Please support independent art. Yes, please. 
All right. Well, Sadro Solbrucato, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Cool. Thank you very much, Jason. I really appreciate it. It's great talking with you. I look forward to talking with you in the future without yes. a microphone. <laughs> okay. Yes, that would be great. All right. Take care, man. Have a you good too. one. And take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please go to my online school for chaos magic, www.magic.me. That's www.magic.me. And check out the free book and eight day email course. Also, definitely subscribe to us on iTunes or SoundCloud if you haven't already. And please send links to the show to anybody you think might appreciate it. Okay, see you next time. 